Today we're going to continue through the book of Acts, and we're really drawing, getting close to the end here. We're in Acts chapter 24, and today we're going to be talking about the gospel on trial, the gospel on trial. Let me pray for us one more time, and we'll keep going. Uh, Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, you're the only reason that we're here, and we're here because, <laughs> because we need you. And so, Lord, we're just, we're just coming to you, the fountain of all blessing, the fountain of all grace, because we're hungry, Lord. We're thirsty. God, we need you. And so, Lord, uh, who, however we come this morning, Lord, with whatever burdens or struggles we, we bear, God, I know and I pray that you would just meet us where we are, that you would minister to our need, that you would speak to us, Lord, because your servants are listening. And Lord, we know that you have something you want to say. And so God, anything in our hearts, in our minds, God, that would hinder us from hearing what you want to say, God, I pray that you would just remove it at this very moment. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit speaks to the churches. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to turn to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. And we pick up today where we left off. Uh, with Paul on trial for the sake of the gospel. And so we know that the Apostle Paul, since he met Jesus on that road to Damascus decades before, that he has devoted his life to making the gospel known to the whole world. And as we've seen throughout this whole series, that the gospel does not go forth without, without opposition. There's a spiritual war taking place. I don't know if you've noticed that. But Satan opposes the advance of his gospel at every step, okay? Which explains how that everywhere Paul went on his three missionary journeys, he faced hardship and, 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 and mobs and riots and beatings and imprisonments and shipwrecks and, and everything he did, there was, there was opposition, okay? And we've seen over the past several weeks how God put a specific calling on Paul's heart to go to Jerusalem. Even though that same Holy Spirit that told him to go to Jerusalem also confirmed to him that when he got there, it was going to, he was going to face the severe trials and afflictions. All right, which of course that is in fact what happens when he arrives in Jerusalem. He is falsely accused of defiling the temple, uh, of bringing a Gentile into the inner temple courts. A mob is formed that is about to kill him, and he is inadvertently uh, saved by the Romans who arrest him, thinking he is. Uh, some other criminal that they know about, all right? And then Paul finds himself caught in the middle of this kind of tug of war between these unbelieving Jews who want him dead and uh, the fickle Roman officials who are really more than willing to subvert justice for political goals, okay? And we see that Paul is, is kind of, he's caught in the middle, but Paul recognizes, recognizes that much more is at stake than himself, Paul recognizes that the gospel itself is on trial and that the basis of their opposition to him is nothing other than the hope of the resurrection itself. So what I want to look at today is just ask this question. What can we learn from Paul's circumstance here as he's on trial? And what can we learn that can help us as we face opposition to the gospel today? That's what I want to talk about as we talk about the gospel on trial from Acts chapter 24. If you're able and willing, let me invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. It says, And after five days the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul, and when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly, for we have found this man to be a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. 
And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it was not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these, the, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. And while I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation, should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing, that I cried out while standing among them, it is respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and, uh, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul, and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. And at the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. All right, so we're looking at Paul's trial before the governor, Felix. And we're going to look at this passage under three headings. Number one here is condemning the gospel. Condemning the gospel. Number two, defending the gospel. And then number three, rejecting the gospel. Rejecting the gospel. So first, we're going to look at condemning the gospel. So when Paul was arrested by the Romans, uh, simultaneously saving him from the Jewish mob, he made a defense before the crowd, you remember. And then the next day, he also made a defense before the Jewish high council. And you remember the way that played out is that he recognized that there was some Sadducees and some Pharisees in the, in the council. And he said that he was on trial for the resurrection of the dead uh, because that's the, central, that's the centerpiece of Christianity. We believe that there is a future resurrection of the dead, that death is not the end, but that Jesus Christ, having physically bodily rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples over a period of many days, proving that he had risen from the dead, demonstrates that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that being the first to rise from the dead, he is the guarantee that there will be a future resurrection of the dead. Okay? And after all that played out, the Roman commander who was mentioned here, Claudius Lysias, recognized that the complaints that the Jews had against Paul were for no violation of Roman law. And Paul, being a Roman citizen, generally should be protected under Roman law, even from the Jewish uh, desires of the Jewish people. And, and Paul, as we remember, was a Roman citizen of some status. And so they knew that they had to treat his case with some care. And we saw last time how uh, the Jews had made a plot to... Uh, Kill Paul, you remember, 40 men uh, made a vow, uh, put themselves under a curse that they would not eat or drink until Paul was dead, and they made a plot that uh, the tribune should bring him down uh, uh, to try his, to learn more about his case, and they were going to kill him on the way. But Paul's nephew, remember, and God's sovereign providence happened to hear about this plot, and they were able to deliver him, and so they take Paul from Jerusalem to the Roman capital of Israel, which, would have, which was the uh, city of Caesarea, which is where Governor Felix, the governor, lived. Okay? And, he, and they were commanded, the Jewish authorities were commanded to go to Caesarea and make their accusations before Governor Felix. 
All right? So we know how, we, we see how serious this matter was to the Jewish people, which again, it's, it's, it's remarkable to us because, you know, Paul, you know, he wasn't in Israel a lot. He was traveling around a lot through the world, but they recognized what a danger Paul was to them because of the gospel that he proclaimed throughout the whole world and how much he had, how, how, uh, uh, how much controversy he had, he had stirred up. And we see how serious they took this because the high priest himself made the journey to accuse Paul. So Felix, the governor, had to take note of that because that was, you know, he was literally the, the highest Jewish official that there was. And he personally came down to Caesarea to make his accusations. Second, we know how big of a deal this was. It's because they actually hired a professional lawyer named Tortolus, a professional speaker who would have been knowledge, knowledgeable of Roman law to bring their accusations before the governor. And we see the accusations that they make there in verse 5. He says there that we have found this man to be a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. So for them, they literally call Paul a plague, okay, a a uh, infectious disease, okay? So everywhere he goes, they say he stirs up riots among the Jews. Uh, the reason for this is because they say he's a ringleader of the sect of this Nazarenes. Probably they intend to mean something like a cult, all right? And on top of all of this, he tried to profane the temple, all right? So before we address these accusations, I just want us to look at how some of these accusations correlate with maybe some things we experience today and uh, how we might learn some lessons here. You know, the language of plague is interesting because some people kind of do that. Some people kind of, even today, really believe that Christians are like this kind of plague on humanity, that if it, was, if it just wasn't for Christianity and religions, that people would be doing so much better, that we, that we cause so much problem, or that even Christianity is a mental illness or the result of mental weakness. You know, this goes back a long way. Karl Marx, uh, the founder of communism, uh, which, by the way, is alive and well today, uh, called uh, Christianity the opium of the people, okay? Uh, and some out there, as I said, seem to want to blame Christianity for all the problems of the world. Now, my point in saying this today isn't to get us, get us all defensive and, and get us all ruffled up. The point that I want to make that I think is important is that we should recognize and the, and the and the world shouldn't be surprised by the fact that, yes, Christianity does stir things up, and Christianity does ruffle some feathers. And the reason for that, and, and I would say this, that's not a vice of Christianity, that's a virtue of Christianity. That's, that's, part, that's part and parcel of what we believe. Because, because if, you, if, if Christianity doesn't ruffle your feathers a little bit, you don't understand what we're talking about. You've missed the point. The reason why some people bristle at Christianity is precisely because they realize the magnitude of the claims that we're making. If, again, if it doesn't ruffle your feathers a little bit, you don't understand what we're saying. Either Jesus Christ is alive or he isn't. There's no other option. Either Jesus is, in fact, the one means granted by God to find the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life, or he isn't. So the nature of Christianity means that you, me, everybody must do something with the person of Jesus of Nazareth. You understand what I'm saying? You cannot ignore Jesus. Think about this. A man who lived in the nowhere Middle East, who only lived to his mid-30s, who wasn't well-educated, he wasn't a political leader, he was a carpenter and a traveling preacher who only had a three-year-long ministry, and no one has changed the world more than him. It's breathtaking. It's mind-boggling. And all of his followers, were with, all of his earliest followers who were eyewitnesses of his life, died, with a few exceptions, went to die painful deaths for their testimony that they saw him alive from the dead. you you got to do something with that. You can't just ignore that. Right? You can call it a myth. You can call Jesus Christ a loon. You can call the apostle liars. But one thing you cannot do is ignore Jesus Christ. If he is who he said he was, then he is God the Son incarnate, the forgiver of sins, the Savior of the world. 
And the only fitting response to who Jesus is is to trust him, is to submit to him, is to surrender him, is to love him, is to obey him. That's the demand of of Jesus on the world. All right? So Jesus must be proclaimed. And so, and yes, of course, that's going to ruffle feathers. All right? It's just, it just is. Because Jesus, Jesus enters in, Jesus entered into the world as God's son, and he rose from the dead victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And he now is the reigning king over the world. And Jesus, and yes, that's the whole point, right? Jesus' kingship. Remember, Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's a lot of authority. And he enters into our world, and what does he do? He challenges our authority, right? Because what? If Jesus is Lord, what does that mean about me? It means I'm not Lord. It means I don't get to do whatever I want to do. And we don't like that, right? It ruffles our feathers. It rubs us the wrong way. We don't want, we don't, we want to be Lord. We don't want Jesus to be Lord. All right? But we have to deal with this question of Christianity, right? And when we understand Jesus, who he is, we recognize he must be proclaimed. And yes, it's going to cause a stir. Further on, furthermore, they accuse Paul of being the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, which was pretty much just accusing Christianity of being a, a dangerous cult, or perhaps he was just brainwashing innocent people. You know, the word brainwashing is kind of funny because we only use that term when it's something we don't agree with, right? Oh, you're just brainwashing people, all right, We're, you know? And so, let, so let's just be honest and real about it. Because, you know, they say, you know, people say we're just brainwashing people. We say the world's brainwashing people. Well, which one's which? Well, here's the reality. So let's just face reality, honestly. The question is not, are there worldviews, are there ideas, are there ideologies out there vying for people's minds? That's not the question. Of course there is. The question isn't, are there ideas out there that are vying for our minds? The question is, which ideas are going to win? That's the question. Right? You're always going to believe, you're always going to believe something, and there's a, there's a popular lie that I hate to say, but we Christians bought for a really long time, and that is that there's something, there's something like a neutral worldview out there. Let me tell you something, guys. There's no such thing as a neutral worldview. Right? Because think about it, right? For a long time, Christians were told, well, you be a Christian at church, you be a Christian at home, but when you come out into this public sphere, you can't you got, you got to leave your Christianity at the door. You got to leave your religions at the door, right? But think about what that, you know, like we, we for a long time we believed that and that kind of made sense to us. But do you really realize what we were being asked to do? We were being told you can be a Christian at home and at church, but when you come into the public, you got to be an atheist. That's what we were told, right? And guess what? We did that. We did that for a long time, but I just want to say there's no such thing as a neutral worldview, all right? If we, if we, exit this building and we talk and live as if there is no God, then we are being a functional atheist. And we, we can't do that, right? And if we just accept that, then we're basically accepting atheism. And so the question is not which ideas are going to capture people's minds. The, uh, which I, what, the question is not are there ideas out there trying to capture people's minds. The question is which ideas are going to win. There is no neutral. If we don't guard our hearts and our children's hearts for Christ's kingdom, Satan will capture them for his right? If we, it, it doesn't matter what we say, if we live like there is no God, then we're, we're, that's basically what we're saying, right? And so, a, and so, and so we have to, we have to be who we are everywhere we are, okay? At all times, all right? And so there is no neutral. And so if we're not bringing Christ to bear in our lives, if we're not bringing Christ to bear in the way we speak, in the way we act, in the way we think, all right, then we're telling a lie, all right? No matter where we are. And then the third charge they bring against Paul is his, is his accusation against profaning the temple, okay? And, what, and what's interesting about that is if you just step back and think about it, humans are incurably religious, all right? It, even, even, even secular, even if you analyze the secular worldview, you'll see that it's functionally a religion, all right? Because what do we do? We have things that we, we have ultimate values, all right? We have things that we think are ultimate is important that are, that are core to our identity, and if anybody threatens or profanes those things, uh, we get upset about it, right? You know, um, we, uh, we, we get upset about it. Why? Because we get upset about what 
we, we get upset about what we value. We get angry about what our idol is or what, our, what we hold sacred, right? The Jews held the temple extremely sacred, so they got really uh, angry when they thought that he had profaned the temple, right? There are things in this world today that if you appear to profane them, people will get really angry about them. All right, think about things like gender and sexuality, all right? And we, when we as Christians just simply say that what we have believed for literally 2,000 years about these things, people get angry about it, but that's because they, that's because to them, those things are sacred. How can you say that? How can you say that? This is sacred. It's, it's me. It's who I am. All right? All right? Thing is, is everyone is incur- incurably religious, and we get so angry and polarized today because, uh, because when, when we perceive something to threaten what we hold sacred. And I just want to say, and this, this, this is important for everyone to recognize. Jesus, Jesus threatens everybody. Because Jesus comes into all of our lives and cleans house. Which is painful, but beautiful. I like to say it hurts so good. No one's safe from Jesus. Religious, irreligious, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. No one's safe from Jesus. When Jesus comes in, he comes in to clean house. And that's why, that's why we want to hold him at arm's length. That's why we really don't want to get to know him because we fear if we get to know him, he, he's going to come clean house. Well, he is. But it's better just to let him do it. It's better just to let him do it. But one thing that we don't have, because sometimes what we want to do is we want to hold fast to our sin like our sin is sacred. And then when Jesus comes to clean house, who do we point the finger at? We point the finger at Jesus. No, no, it's your, you're the problem, Jesus. You're messing with what I love. Well, maybe we love the wrong things. And Jesus is coming in to reorient our lives. Change the way, change the way so we can see things as they really are in view of the way God ordered and created them to be. So Jesus ultimately isn't against us. He's for us, but he is against our sin that destroys us. He is against our idols that take away our our love and allegiance from the one to whom it really belongs. And so the world, you know, the the world's going to condemn the gospel. The world's going to misunderstand the gospel. But our our part, our our job is to just, is is to stand firm is to hold fast to Christ, is to recognize that there is no neutral, right? Is to walk in daily, everyday, consistent obedience to Christ, to own our faith in public and in private, and to be witnesses of who Christ is, the loving Savior King who comes to clean house because he loves us. So number one, condemning the gospel. Number two, defending the gospel. Defending the gospel. So Paul here begins to make his defense and he points out that it's been no more than 12 days since he went up to worship in Jerusalem, which most likely means that he had only spent a total of 12 days in the city before the mob happened and he got arrested and all those things take place. And so he points that out because, uh, to the Romans, because that's a verifiable fact. Paul had traveling companions. There were people there in the city who knew exactly how long Paul had been there, all right? And that's important because one of their accusations was Paul, they accused Paul of starting the riot. And the same, and the, the thing that happened in Jerusalem is the same thing that happened everywhere Paul went. Yes, Paul preached the gospel, but Paul didn't start riots. It's the people who heard the gospel who didn't like it that started the riots <laughs> everywhere Paul went. The reason why the riot started in Jerusalem <clears throat> wasn't even for a legitimate reason. He wasn't, he wasn't even publicly teaching like he did in the other cities. <clears throat> the only thing he did in Jerusalem <clears throat> was go to offer some sacrifices in the temple. And at one point, some people saw him hanging out with a Gentile, with a non-Jew, and they assumed that he had brought him into the temple, even though they didn't actually see him with the Gentile into the temple. So, and so all of those were verifiable facts, all right? Nevertheless, the Jews made it a point to accuse Paul of, of starting riots and inciting rebellions because they were, they were politically uh, clever, okay? That the riots and, and starting insurrections and rebellions uh, was a very serious crime under Roman law, and they knew the governor would not be able to ignore those kinds of accusations, all right? But the point, Paul's point, is that 12 days in Jerusalem is not enough time to cultivate 
uh, some kind of cultural revolution, all right? He wasn't there long enough to start a revolution, even if he wanted to, all right? And in fact, as I said, he had not even, he wasn't even teaching or disputing with people as he did in other places, okay? He was literally just there to, to, to bring the, uh, the collection to the Jewish people, to the Jewish Christians, and to, um, uh, to make some, some, some offerings, all right? And so, and so the fact is, is that they cannot prove the accusations that they're making against Paul and Roman law, thank God, uh, like it should be, rightly recognized that the burden of proof was on the accuser, okay? Innocent until proven guilty, all right? If you don't understand why that should be a principle in, in just law, then just imagine being falsely accused of some kind of crime and have everyone treat you as guilty when you did nothing wrong you'll understand why it should be a part of law that we're innocent until proven guilty, all right? And so when Paul makes his defense, okay, he he says this in verse 14. He says, I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection both of the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience both toward God and man. So again, this is interesting, right? Because they accuse him of being this ringleader and starting uh, rebellions and riots and all this, all right? And they accuse him of, um, of being part of the sect of this Nazarene, of these Nazarenes, these bad Nazarenes, okay? Which they just mean Christian, right? But what's interesting is that Paul here just openly admits that he's a Christian, right? So the thing that they think is so bad, Paul's just like, yeah, yeah, I follow they called it the way. That was the way they referred to it back then. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he said, yeah, I'm a follower of the way. I'm a Christian, okay? It wasn't illegal at that time to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And what's, but what's even more important for us is that, again, Paul's making these accusations are being made by Jewish people. And what's more important is Paul's conception of Christianity uh, which, again, he's standing before the accusation of the high priest that, is, that he's part of some kind of cult, okay? And what Paul is saying is that ac- actually the opposite is true. Uh, the, the, the law and the prophets, which is just a way to refer to the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, right? Which the Jewish people who are accusing him, they claim to believe in this, the scripture, the Old Testament, right? And Paul is basically saying, I, I, I believe in the same scripture that, that they do, all right? I'm not, this is, for, for Paul, right? For Paul, Christianity was not some kind of erroneous sect or cult, all right? Rather, Paul believes, now this is crazy, this, was, this would have blew their minds, right? But Paul believes he never, he never even left Judaism. He never left Judaism, all right? For him, Christianity is in fact the fulfillment of the Jewish scripture, That is, if you really believe the Jewish scripture, the scripture that they claim to believe, you, essentially he's saying, you'd be a Christian because the scriptures testified about Jesus. You remember in the gospel of John, Jesus himself kind of had the audacity to tell the Jewish authorities. He said, if you believe Moses, you would believe me. If you believe the scripture you claim to believe, you would believe me because they, they testify about me. So for Paul, Christianity isn't merely an offshoot of Judaism. Christianity is Judaism in its purest form. All right? It is Judaism fulfilled. It is the promises of God consummated through forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, who now extends God's mercy to all people, Jew and non-Jew alike. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament Scripture, to be the perfect Jew, not just the perfect Jew, but to be the perfect person, to satisfy the demands of God's righteousness that we could not uphold on our own. And in so doing, he's able to offer himself in our place a willing sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins, a divine exchange takes place where Jesus takes on our sins and through faith in Christ, we receive Christ's righteousness. And so our sins are paid for by Christ on the cross. We are 
we receive Christ's righteousness by faith so that as a gift of an undeserved gift of God, we get to stand before God righteous in Christ. It's a good deal. And that's what Jesus came to do. And this wasn't just an accident like, whoopsie, you know, God happened to save the world. It was part of the plan. It it was the plan. The whole Old Testament was part of that plan to prophesy about the coming, the, the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And them making these accusations against Paul, Paul was like, look, I'm not some kind of seditious rebel. All right, he's saying, you want to know who I am? This is who I am. I'm a believer in these scriptures. I have a hope. I have a hope in the future resurrection of the dead. And notice what he says there. He says that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. You know, sometimes we forget about that. But it's not just Christians who will be raised from the dead. Everybody will be raised from the dead. To do what? to stand before the judgment of God. So, this, so the, death is not the end. It's just the beginning. Everyone will rise one day from the dead, both the just and the unjust, to stand before the judgment of God. And th- those whose sins have been forgiven through Christ will receive reward according to their faithfulness, and those who die apart from Christ will receive punishment apart, uh, uh, in accordance with the way that they live their life. And so there's a future judgment. And Paul says what? He says, because of that, I have always taken pains to have a clear conscience before God and man. You see, Paul's not out there just doing whatever Paul wants to do. Paul says, no, there's a, there's a God who rules the world, that there's a future resurrection and a judgment that's coming. And he says, and I want to live as somebody who recognizes that I'm going to have to stand before God one day. So everything I do, I try to have a clear conscience before God and man because I know that I'm going to have to give an account for my life. Jesus said, Jesus said that we'll have to give an account for every idle word that we spoke. A judgment is coming, all right? We will all stand before the Lord of all the earth. Time is short. And so we then should be like, we should imitate Paul here, right? That we labor to have a clean conscience in all that we do. If your conscience condemns you about something, repent and make it right. And, and Repent and make it right. Jesus is coming, y'all. He's coming back. And we got to be ready. You know, today, you know, we, we talk about this and like there's all this cultural stuff and it's easy to get canceled and stuff and we, people want to look like they're on the right side and all this stuff. Look, guys, the day's coming when the old, there's only one side you're going to want to be on. And it's not on this side. It's not on that side. It's not on this political party. It's not on this, that political party. You want to be on the right side of God Almighty. And there's only one way to do that. It's through trusting and believing and following His Son. It's the only way. It's the only way. You see, Paul goes on here, he goes on to mention these Jews from Asia, the ones who actually had stirred up that mob that day in Jerusalem. He says they're not even, they weren't even there. Uh, they, they weren't even there to, to make their accusations. And so Paul gets to the heart of the matter by, by saying that he was on trial with respect to the resurrection. And so the Jewish authorities, they came trying to get Paul you know, for violations of Roman law. But the truth is, and even the governor Felix knew this, that the real reason that they hated Paul was not political. It was theological. It was theological. The fact that God raises the dead proved by the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, which proves that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And so note the key components here of defending the gospel. Having a clean conscience before God and then holding fast to the historical fact of the resurrection. This is our hope, guys, and this this is the centerpiece of Christianity, right? Most other religions, just about every other religion, is a works-based religion. You do this and God may do this, all right? And, 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 it's, and, and lots of it is just moral, moral principalizing, all right? But that's actually not Christianity. Christianity 
is first about a historical fact. A man rose from the dead. And if he's alive, he's worthy of our life, our worship, and our all. So number one, condemning the gospel. Number two, defending the gospel. And then finally here, rejecting the gospel. Rejecting the gospel. So we see Felix. And Felix had been um, a ruler over that region for some time. So he wasn't ignorant of all the things taking place. He, was, he had a rather accurate knowledge of the way, he said. So that means of Christianity. So almost certainly Felix knew that these charges against Paul were bogus. That, that Christians were not the ones out there starting riots and, and, and doing all that crazy stuff. Okay? Nevertheless, Felix, uh, when, it, when it comes to his judgment, he refuses... He refuses to decide on the case, and rather, he leaves Paul's case undecided for two years. Talk about a, talk about a miscarriage of justice, y'all, being, being in prison for two years on, on un, uh, ungrounded accusations, all right, with, with the judge just refusing to decide the case, all right? And so, so that, that's, that's the situation that Paul found himself in. Now, thankfully, as an unconvicted Roman citizen, his imprisonment wasn't cruel, and he was able to have some freedoms, and his friends were able to, to attend to his needs and stuff like that. But it's interesting here that it says that Felix called for Paul often to converse with him, and it says there that he was hoping to receive a, a, a bribe, okay? So politics is politics, y'all, and it's been going on for a long time. And so we learn more about who Felix really is here and that he wanted to bri- bribe from Paul. And of course, you know, part, part, part of you feels sorry for Paul and you're like, hey man, Paul, if you would have just gave him some money, you know, maybe he could have got you out of jail. But Paul's like, no, I'm not going to, uh, you, know, you know what the Bible says about giving bribes? Not good. And he refused to do that, even though he probably could have got out of jail. Um, but Paul didn't play his games, but what did he do? Paul shared the gospel with him. And what's interesting, and this is interesting, y'all, in verse 25 there, it says that Paul reasoned with Felix about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. So that's interesting, right? Felix is not Jewish, all right? But as Paul is talking with him, what does he talk with him about? Righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. In other words, what did Paul talk with Felix about? He talked with him about the hard stuff, He talked with him about the hard stuff, righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. He wasn't beating around the bush. He wasn't trying to make Felix feel good, all right? Uh, Felix, his wife is mentioned there in passing. Felix's wife was named Drusilla. Drusilla was Jewish, and she was a notoriously famous, uh, notoriously beautiful young woman. She was a teenage bride, and she was actually married to another man, a vassal king, and Felix shows up and uh, somehow abuses his authority and his power and gets Drusilla for his own wife, okay? And so this is the kind of man that we're dealing with, all right? He finagled his way to steal another man's wife, and what is Paul talking with him about? Righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. Well, it's interesting there, right, that what does it say? It says, it says that Felix was alarmed. What a way to put it, right? He was alarmed by these things. Well, guess what? I'd be alarmed too, if I totally lacked righteousness and self-control and I was told that there was a coming judgment. But that was the point, right? It scared him, all right? It scared him. But it didn't scare him enough for him to do something about it. And so that's what it boils down to, y'all. Without the hard truths, the gospel is meaningless. I think a lot of people, for a lot of people, the gospel means nothing to them Because what does it mean being saved from something if I don't think I need saving? It doesn't mean anything, all right? Jesus died to save you from your sins. Okay, that would be great if I was that bad of a sinner. But I'm not, right? Or am I? You see, we got to get to the hard truths. I'm not saying be mean, but I'm saying we got to get to the hard truths for the gospel to even make sense. The hard truths being I am a sinner. I have sinned. I've sinned against God. Sin against an infinite God is an infinite sin. I am not right with God. I, I, my life doesn't belong to me, but it was given to me by God, and I've used my whole life for me and not for God. Is God going to be cool with that? 
I have done things that even, before, even, even, even not as a Christian, even without even knowing anything the Bible says, I have done things that I know I shouldn't have done. If I was to stand before the judgment of God on the last day, I wouldn't even need God to condemn me. My own conscience would condemn me because I've done things I know I shouldn't have done. And I didn't do things I know I should have done. I wouldn't even need God's judgment. I would judge myself on the last day. How am I going to stand before the judgment of God? All right? I am separated from God. I am alienated from my creator. So what do I, I don't have righteousness. I don't have self-control. So what do I need? I need Jesus. I need Jesus who can give me his righteousness as a gift because I could not be righteous on my own. I need the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives to those who believe in him, who can actually come and indwell my heart and change me from the inside out and actually give me self-control that I couldn't produce on my own. I need Jesus who will be able to stand with me on the day of judgment when I know that I don't deserve to get into heaven and Jesus stand there and say, it's okay, he's with me. I need Jesus. We all do. And that's the gospel. And what Jesus does is breathtaking, but it makes no sense if we don't understand the hard things, the hard truths, that Jesus came to save us from ourselves, from our sins, that we are lost and dying and destined for eternal separation from God in hell, apart from the mercy of God that he is freely extending to all who believe in him. So yes, you should know about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. We woke up today, and the judgment hasn't come yet. So what does that mean? It It means God gave you at least one more day. It means he gave us all at least one more day to receive his mercy, to turn from our sins, trust in Jesus, risen from the dead, reigning from heaven, to turn from our sins and trust in him, and we will receive the gift of his righteousness. We will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to be transformed by him. We will receive the gift of standing before God one day, unafraid and unashamed, because we have received salvation through the Son. And so as we close, as we close this morning, I just extend the, the simplest but most important of all invitations. And that is that, you know, we don't have to be like Felix. We don't have to be alarmed, but then push it away and ignore it, knowing what we need to do in our heart. We can receive it, turn from our sins, trust in Christ, receive the gift, and find the salvation that only God can give. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much that in view of things like righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, in view of these things, you have given us your son. Yes, Lord, it's true. We were hopeless. There was no hope. There was no way that we could stand right before you. And so the good news of the gospel is that you made a way where there was no way. You sent your only son born of a virgin, to come and live a life without sin, to die the death in our place, to rise from the dead victorious over sin, hell, and the grave, and to give the hope of eternal resurrection life to all those who hope in you. And so, Lord, first of all, we just say we're grateful. We're thankful to belong to you. We're thankful, God, that you that you opened our eyes to see our need of you. We're thankful for the the blessings and mercy that you have lavished upon us in innumerable ways. And God, I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone in this room this morning that needs to take that step of faith and obedience, God, I pray with all my heart that they would trust in you, that they would turn to you, they would call on you for mercy, knowing, Lord, that you'll never turn away anyone 
who truly comes to you. God, I pray that they would just surrender to you now in their hearts. Believe in you as the risen and reigning King. And I pray, God, that you would fill them with your Spirit and empower them for a life of faith and love and joy and hope. That only you can provide. It's in Christ's name.